It is hard to believe that this gentle crocus yields the most precious spice of all. These crocuses are members of the iris family. They resemble those common to the garden, but they bloom in autumn. Saffron, the spice, is the flower's orangey-yellow stigmas, its female sex organs. This is the southernmost tip of England, the coast of Cornwall, one of the few remaining outposts of saffron culture. Saffron plays a part in the lives of these fishermen, yet they are hardly aware that it first grew long ago in the near eastern town of Coricus. Nobody knows whether the plant gave its name to the town or vice versa. But in this town, Port Leven, it is a special saffron day. St. Peter's tide, when the families of fishermen honour the fishermen of old. This isn't molten gold, but it's the next best thing. Saffron, dissolved in water and simmered with sugar. Pour in a whole bucket of eggs, some butter, yeast, a crate of fresh raisins, and mix a mountain of sweet Cornish festival dough. The tradition started when Cornish women of old put in whole strands of saffron. But they could afford to. They didn't have to feed the multitude. Saffron buns and bread once were common throughout Britain. Everyone ate them. In this tiny corner, the taste was never lost. These bakers spent the night baking the last native British delicacy dependent on saffron. The tea treat bun is special. It's the size of a tea plate and contains extra everything, eggs, raisins and saffron. There is no dearth of takers, especially after the brisk morning march to this field above the town. The children, of course, are less interested in tradition than taste. In that respect, the buns have scored a remarkable hit. The adults, sheltered in their marquee, enjoy tea with a more everyday saffron cake. Nobody really knows when saffron came to Cornwall. Perhaps the seafaring Phoenicians introduced it, who knows? Whatever, it has always been and will always be. An old writer wrote, saffron cake on which the Cornish child is weaned and which he goes on eating till the last day of his life. Saffron's taste is a reminder of the sea, a bit bitter like the iodine of seaweed. It was loved by the Phoenician sailors who brought it here to the harbour of Marseille. Today, visitors pack the quayside restaurants, hoping to sample firsthand the legendary fare of this French port. Above all, they seem obsessed with one thing, the genuine, the original, the authentic bouillabaisse. The trouble is that each restaurant, while claiming authenticity, makes it differently. There is no one right bouillabaisse, just many wrong ones. Originally, it was a fisherman's stew prepared from the portion of the catch not sold at market. A poor man's meal, which changed every day, made a little special by a few strands of saffron. Ironically, most of the catch at market now goes into bouillabaisse. From its very unromantic beginning, this plat de pêche now satisfies strivings for sophisticated chic. The dish depends upon the tremendous variety of fish found in Marseille waters. Each adds its own distinctive taste. Wonderful fish stews are made elsewhere, but they are not bouillabaisse. 
Local waters boast Racas, Racas Blanche, Aranje, Galinette, Saint Pierre, Baudois, Fella, Chapon, and if you must say Gal de Mer and Langouste. No wonder the French call seafood fruit of the sea. The first task is to trim the fish. About half the varieties used should have firm flesh, the rest soft. Heads and trimmings are saved. They will be combined with parsley, fennel, orange peel and other spices to produce a fine white fish stock. One story of Bouillabaisse's origin suggests that the goddess Venus concocted it to put her husband to sleep while she enjoyed a little peccadillo on the side. The French themselves are most fond of this tale. The heavenly recipe calls for chopped onions to be added to the finest olive oil. Then garlic, also chopped, not crushed. In the ancient Mediterranean world, tomatoes were not known, but since Venus was a goddess, she would have understood they had to be peeled, seeded and coarsely chopped, leaving just the soft goodness of the pulp. Ah, and saffron. It's essential to bouillabaisse and said to have aphrodisiac powers. Perhaps that's why Venus invented it. Or the oil base, that is. In goes a touch of ginger. And next, the fish stock prepared earlier from the heads and trimmings. Now turn up the heat, forcing flames to engulf the pot until the brew boils ferociously and binds the ingredients. Fish is added in stages, first the firm, then the more delicate. Finally, the shellfish. Boil again for 10 minutes. Uh, bouillé means to boil, abaissé to evaporate. Together, bouillé base. <laughs> Here, the broth is served over tranche, slices of bread. One renegade establishment claims only potatoes are authentic. Well, the fish is served separately. It is, however, permissible to serve them together. True aficionados never eat bouillabaisse later than lunch. By the afternoon, they say, the fish is very old. But in Marseille, lunch can last and last and last. Saffron, Walden, Cambridgeshire, England. Saffron, they say, was brought here long ago. A crocus corn was hidden in the staff of a pilgrim who smuggled it from the Levant. So cherished was the spice that it is remembered in every detail in this church. The finest saffron in all Europe grew here in great abundance. The growers were called crocus. Alas, today in Saffron Walden, the only saffron crocuses are those of stone, wood or fabric. But so valuable was the spice and so easily imitated that not everyone selling saffron sold saffron. Joost Findeke was executed in Nuremberg, Germany in 1444, accused of selling false yellow substances as saffron. He was judged by saffron inspectors and burned to death with his false spice. The people of medieval Europe had a passion for saffron. It grew everywhere, yet, weight for weight, it was more precious than the pepper imported from afar. It coloured and seasoned everything, especially the ever-present heavily spiced stews. Then suddenly, almost inexplicably, saffron vanished. A solution to the riddle of saffron's disappearance can be found right here, in the tiny town of Consuegra, in the mountains of Spain. In most of Europe, saffron cultivation ceased when the Industrial Revolution absorbed all the available labour. Here in Consuegra, the only machines are the windmills. Endlessly yielding to the hot, dry winds, 
they mimic the never-changing patterns of life below. Saffron growing of all human activities is one of the most tedious and labor-intensive. Here, the Casas family and some friends stoop to gather the demanding, lovely flowers. The harvest lasts only two weeks. Flowers must be picked daily, immediately after sunrise, or they risk damage from the burning sun. These rocky fields must be kept tilled year round. The terrain and size of the plot makes mechanization impossible. The growing cycle is four years. Only the last two yield a relatively decent crop. Then the field must be left to rest for a long time. After just one cycle, new fields must be planted using corms or bulblets, which grow at the base of existing bulbs. Whole flowers are harvested in their thousands, in their millions. But only the tiny strands of stigma will be saffron. These must be separated from the flowers by hand, one by one. The elderly and the women bear much of the burden as younger people leave to find jobs elsewhere. Stigmas must be removed daily before the flowers wilt. Now the idea is to use the thumbnail of one hand to loosen the pistols, while the fingers of the other hand tear off the stigmas and deposit them in a pile. And the operation is repeated over and over and over again. At night, families huddle together for warmth and company, but the separating never stops. At daybreak, this group once more will be back in the fields. Saffron makes nobody here rich. It simply supplements already meagre incomes. Perhaps it will mean a wedding gift, perhaps clothes for the children. And the price of spice depends upon the world demand. If prices are low, as often they are, the family will hold back most of the crop, hoping for a price rise. The saffron they keep in a small wooden box, tightly wrapped so it doesn't lose weight. The fresh stigmas do lose weight when they are dried. This is done in sieves over a low charcoal fire. When dried, the stigmas become the spice, saffron. Once, someone performed the tedious exercise of counting and found that to produce only one ounce of saffron, it took no less than 5,184 flowers. The stigmas in the bowl are this field's yield. This is the total produce after drying. Saffron, to survive, requires not only labor, but civilized society to appreciate its subtleties. When ancient Rome fell, saffron declined. But across the sea arose yet another rich and imperial civilization. So entranced were its people with the spice's color, they named it in honor of their word for yellow, Zafran. It was the Arabs who, with the rise of Islamic culture and refinement, acquired a taste for saffron. They came to these Spanish lakes over a thousand years ago. Here they planted rice. Here the rice of the lake met the saffron of the field to create the culinary treasure of Spain, paella. Like bouillabaisse, there are countless versions of this famous dish. Here, seafood is frying in olive oil. A handful of calamares, or little squid, is the last of the fish to go in. Juan Castillo is a payero. He has personally overseen the creation of more than 20,000 paellas. After tapping in some ground sweet pepper or paprika, he adds just enough moist tomato to prevent the ingredients from scorching. Green beans, sweet peppers or peas are optional. But the Arab's gift, rice, is essential. The trick of paella is to add the rice dry, then it soaks up the tastes in the pan. Juan Castillo explains that the name for the dish itself, paella, is derived from the shallow two-handed pan, a paellera. One hates to admit it, but if the weather turns foul, he is forced to cook his paellas inside in a more conventional shallow casserole. Although sometimes he varies his ingredients, he would not even think of using other than the famous rice of Valencia, whose almost round grains taste like none other. 
Outside of Spain, he admits white, long-grained rice is a fair substitute. Water or pre-prepared stock to cook the rice. Enough salt to taste. And then comes the other absolutely essential paella ingredient, saffron. It is here for both colour and taste. As always, the smallest amount turns the mere special to exquisite. A bit of a stir and cook another ten minutes. And there we are, paella. And not only the diners are enjoying the delights of saffron, it's festival time for the harvesters. And at the festival, the highlight is, believe it or not, a saffron picking contest. Saffron has grown here since long ago. The ancient Persians noticed saffron's great solubility in water. They understood that it penetrates to the very heart of rice. To Shiite Muslims, the ten holy days of the month of Mohran are a time of intense celebration. The golden rice plays its part. Traditionally, it is a gift exchanged between families and is called Sholizad. In modern Iran, each family vies to make theirs the most splendid of all, with decorations of fruit or the purest silver leaf. In India, according to the Hindu custom, it is traditional for women to offer gifts of food for the gods each morning. those bringing food themselves are honoured in a very special way. A paste containing strands of saffron marks the forehead. This is a gesture of blessing, good luck and beneficence. Saffron has long been cherished in India as medicine and food as well as for holy ritual. Preparing for the Friday night Sabbath is one of the holiest rituals a Jewish woman can perform. Sabbath must stand apart from the rest of the week. It must be special. By putting saffron into the customary golden chicken soup, cooking expert Evelyn Rose is not only preparing for Sabbath, she is rediscovering an old tradition fallen into disuse. Here, once again, Saffron has found a small, out-of-the-way cultural corner. Here, once again, it enriches the lives of its users. The idea of the Sabbath is that once weekly, ordinary souls can enter the kingdom of the eternal. Good food, like this soup, helps. So does the colour gold. In generations past, this was emphasised by the use of saffron.
two hands first. That's right. Mrs. Rose also has put saffron in the dough for the challah, the Sabbath bread. That's right. Now, now two That's hands. Right. That's it. Two hands, you push it out. Yeah, but gently, uh -huh. because you don't want to flatten it. The Jewish yeah. custom says the bread must be broken and not well, cut with a knife. The right. dough is kneaded and shaped in a special way. Now we get to the really interesting part, the plaiting. So we want to get these in a sort of fan shape, mm -hmm. joined at one end. One. The plaiting of this precious one. bread yeah. is another tradition passed from mother two, to daughter. Three. They seem to be growing Four. more. Yes. Very strange. <laughs> but they're already beginning to rise a little bit. Now, the great secret is to have the sort of secret formula of this. And it's five over two, one over three, and two over three. Right. So, right, so. five over two. Yeah. Right. One over three. One over three. Ooh. All right. That's, it. that's right. It's definitely alive. Two over three. Two over three. And you're trying to build it up. Yeah. That's right. right. Now, so five, over five over two. two. One over three, two over three. Right. Yeah. Five over two, one over three, <laughs> two, two over three. three. That's right. Five over two, one over three, two over three. three. Five over two, one over three, Ooh. two over three, three, and something else. That's <coughs> right. Yeah. Very good. Now, the end. now let's just sort of give it a bit of a, a roll to shape it. Like Saffron to colour yeah. the inside, and just before baking, the loaf is coated with egg to give it its glossy golden brown colour outside. Baruch at Adonai, Elohim Melchalam, a Mautzi Lachem Min Haaretz. The custom of using saffron in both challah and chicken soup was popular generations ago in Eastern Europe. These are mm. um, you haven't got one yet. Hey, that's no, fantastic. Thinking chicken soup. What's wow. the, sink the smell of the soup with its generous matzo balls uh, seems to confirm this experiment a success. It's okay. Mm. Yeah. Use that side. Yeah, you can do that. Really. It's the same logic idea as you. But it's not wise to get so much. Mm. 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 This soup just has the smell that my mother's chicken soup. Yeah, I can smell the saffron so clearly. Yeah. It takes me back so many years. Yeah, that's, that's just like your grandma used to make. This is a special flavour. It's such a glorious flavour. You, you smell rather than taste. Mm. We've been waiting a long time for all this, haven't we? <laughs> Saffron is one of life's real pleasures. Important to the taste, the eye, and the spirit. <laughs> Is it now so hard to believe that this gentle crocus yields the most precious spice of all? <laughs> 